Good morning. I'm going to practice my attention get in skills that I just learned and I'm going to let you know that we're going to start in 10 seconds. So please wind down the wonderful conversations that you are engaged in right now. Isn't it nice to work with people you love? People who make you want to be better. People who are happy. I know I feel that way when I walk in here. We are going to begin by singing. Which hymn did you pick, Denise? How Great Thou Art, hymn 86. Denise is going to play for us. And... Julie, that's right. Thank you. Julie will pray for us. And then after Julie prays, we will have our morning devotional thought offered by Ty Crossley. Okay, how great thou art, 86.
Well, good morning. It's good to good to be with you. Um, you know, you look I, as I was preparing for my devotional this morning. Uh, <laughs> hoping to have one of those experiences where you you wake up early in the morning and you just you know have that have that that revelation that comes and and you just you have it have it all work out well. This morning, as I woke up, there was this song that was going through my mind. I woke up really early, and this song just wouldn't leave my head, and it went over and over and over and over, and it was, Mama said there'll be days like this. There'll be days like this, my mama said. And I don't know where that came from, but I thought it was hilarious, you know, and it just wouldn't leave my mind, and I think I've won the song game, because the rest of you are going to be singing that for the, for the rest of the day. Um, I... I thought it was also a little bit humorous as I was I was reading in my scriptures this morning. I, I read Second Nephi thirty one three that says, um, "For the Lord God giveth light unto the understanding; for He speaketh unto men according to their language and unto their understanding." <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, I guess I have kind of a simple mind, right? And the Lord is trying to to make me laugh. Um, I thought a lot about how, for me, transformation is is not an event. Um, it's a process or a series of events, you know, that slowly change me and change us to, to be more like a Heavenly Father. And I, I think that the ultimate goal of, of transformation is for us to become one in Christ, um, for Christ to be, to be in us and to be manifested uh, through us to, to all around us. I love the, the scripture that, that teaches uh, in, in John it says, But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. And I think the, the experiences that have helped me to come closer to my Savior and to really transform me are those that, that have filled me with the love of, of my Heavenly Father and helped me to have his love in my heart for, for those that, that we teach and my, my children, my family, um, people that I don't even know um, that's where the transformation really, really comes. And I love that idea of, also, it, it, again, it's reflected in this, this scripture, in him verily is the love of God perfected, he who keepeth his word. Um, I, 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 th I was thinking about it, just two experiences from teaching here at American Heritage where, where that's happened to me. Um, one was <laughs> when a couple years ago, when Callan Quinn walked through my, my door, my classroom door. And Callan was, was hooked up to oxygen and, um, and just a delightful, bright, happy little girl. And, just, and I looked at the, the, the trials and struggles that, that she experienced. She went through open heart surgery in, in seventh grade and just was always impressed with with. Her, her attitude, she was so cheerful and so happy, and nothing could keep her down or get her down for a long period of time. And, uh, and I wondered, how is, how is this going to work you know, with, with her, uh, with these challenges that she has? But she taught me about the love of my Savior, Jesus Christ. And she taught me about um, how to, to look at everyone around her with, as she taught me through her example of looking at everyone around her through the eyes of, of God. Um, I thought of another young, young man that I had in class, uh, one of my first years of teaching, and this is one of those typical uh, young men who has tons of energy, can't stay in his seat at, at all, um, always wandering about the room kind of a thing, and, and you try to redirect and, and lovingly correct, and he really struggled to read. And I felt that I was blessed with some resources, you know, that, you know, I never would have been able to do it on my own, but I was blessed with individuals who, who were uh, experts in the field, and they came to me, and they shared their learning with me, and so I started tutoring this, this young man one-on-one, -on -one. and uh, the miracle was, <laughs> the miracle happened where I got a text from his mother saying that she had been calling all over for him, couldn't find him anywhere and finally found him hiding behind the couch reading a book. <laughs> and tears were streaming down her face as she told me that he had never picked up a book before in his life and just and read it. And I was so grateful 
for what I saw as the hand of the Lord guiding me and directing me with, to know what to do to help, to help him so that he could reach his potential. It was quite comical. I mean, he, he was a very active young man throughout his experience here at American Heritage School, and it was pretty comical to see, <laughs> go into the, the temple and see him there and to see Bob Wheeler at the veil, and Bob was the one who pulled him through the veil. It was <laughs> really a sweet experience. Bob's look of, as, as he saw him walk up was, it was just, he was startled. It was, it was really, it was really, really fun. But he has gone through a transformational experience, and, and what is a testimony to me of the, the love of the Lord, how he places people in our path to help us to, to change, and to become our best selves. Um, <clears throat> Just wanted to share one more thing as I was preparing uh, for the devotional. I went back through my journals a little bit, and I remember uh, I found what I wrote. I don't write very much in my journal. That's one thing I need to, to change. But um, I found where I had written about a devotional that I gave in 2015 in front of, of you. And I started out with this story that I want to end with. Um, it, it was just a, a powerful reminder to me of, of who we are. I was having a little conversation with Timothy. He was between two and three years old at the time. And I was having one of those moments where I was thinking, am I, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Am I, am I in the right place? Um, am I having the impact and the influence? I mean, I have this regularly, right? It happens all, all the time. But um, I, I needed a confirmation that I was doing what I, I should be doing and where I should be, that kind of a thing. And so I asked Timothy, I said, Timothy, what should I be when I grow up? And he said, a little boy. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's, let's turn this around. What do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, yours, little boy. And I just thought how, what a powerful perspective that gives us. If we can remember our identity, that we are children of our Heavenly Father, that really at the end of our lives, all as we are is a little boy or a little girl that's gone home to our Father in Heaven. I, I hope and pray that we can help these children that we teach remember their identity and hold on to the, the truth that they are children of our Heavenly Father. Um, and I share that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Remembering identity. There was a, uh, was it Sister Corden in our last general conference who told the story of being called by the prophet and he asked her, what did these young women worldwide need to know? And that's how she responded. She said, they need to know who they are. And then he added to that. He said, yes, and they need to know what they can become. Divine identity, divine purpose two very important cousin terms. Uh, Ty, I was also grateful that you made the comment about transformation not being an event, but rather being a process. We've had several, several uh, devotional thoughts that have spoken to that very theme. Um, two that come to mind are Small and Simple Things by Renee Brady, and then also Adrian's Semester One uh, presentation about her son um, and various vignettes along the way. Aren't we grateful that it's a process and not an event? Aren't we grateful that we don't have to come to work every day saying, well, I hope it happens. And then we worry about if it doesn't. Instead, we can come and we can say, it's happening. Not quite sure exactly to what degree or extent it's happening today, but it's happening. And sometimes we take two steps forward and one step backward, but it's happening. Transformation is happening. Thank you, Ty. Thank you, Denise, for playing for us. And thank you, Julie, for praying. Sharnay, I'm wondering how many times have you been the uh, primary music leader? That was, uh, that was really good, you know, on the fly sign language that helped us to know that in the words of that second verse. I got, I got like 75% thanks to you. That was great. And then I'm wondering um, where this gavel came from. This is either, this was here this morning, this is either a prop or 
uh, someone's trying to give me a hint. Anyway. Charnay is going to explain that to us in a minute. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay, We're, we will begin with a couple of reminders and updates before we jump into some of the, the topics of our general session this morning. First, um, this is uh, yet another reminder. Um, please, please uh, be conscientious of the duties to which you've been assigned, recess, lunch, carpool. If you do not remember when you are assigned, here's where you can find it. This is on the Veracross faculty portal in the teacher resource link tab. That's when you get to the main portal and you scroll down and on the right side there's this icon that looks like this apple. You click on that and you get this other page with all these links. Um, please remember to bring your walkie-talkie with you and check in with the front office early so that they know your spot is covered, so that they know that they don't need to scramble to find a last-minute substitute. Liz, I'm going to ask you to come up and take the microphone for the, the first part of this next reminder. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> so um, we are looking for ways to use positive reinforcement with our high school students. They don't have a core classroom model like you do in K-8 with a teacher that they see for hours every day who can make sure to follow up on uniform repeatedly until they get in uniform. So several of us will be doing these drop-in inspections. and. Um, we will try to make it a fun and positive um, event for them because they all love to see me. I can tell by their faces, especially when they run away, when they see me walking down the hall. And um, make it a fun and positive thing for them with some kind of positive reinforcement. Um, so we'll just randomly be doing that, probably especially on Fridays. Those are our hardest days and probably earlier on Friday so that we can help them get into their full Friday dress um, in the morning on Friday. So if you just let them, can give them reminders and let them know, people will be dropping by and you'll be happy if you are in full dress uniform. Yeah, Camille. Well, we had a great time. Um, we. We did find a number of minor violations. We, um, we would go into classrooms typically and ask everyone to, to stand up and just do some reviews. OK, boys, what's your haircut supposed to look like? Girls, what's your um, <clears throat> skirt length supposed to be? What kind of shoes are we supposed to have on today? And um, the ones that I know well, I would tease. <laughs> and. Um, and we would just kind of go around and make little notes. And we, we did have one grade that only, I think we dropped into seven classrooms. We had one grade that there were only two students. That It was the 10th grade. There were only two students that had um, a, a minor issue with their uniforms. And so we're going to continue to try to use that method. Thank you, Liz. Um, I do want to just underscore one point that she made. Um, we do try to be fairly consistent um, where consistency makes sense. Um, and it initially felt a little strange to, to take one approach in high school and, and, and not apply that elsewhere. But Liz reminded me of, of that very important point that she shared earlier in her comments, and that is that we do not have homeroom teachers in high school. Um, so. The relationship dynamic and the accountability dynamic is quite different. And so for that reason, at the very least, we're, we're experimenting with a few different approaches. Uh, just generally speaking, a um, couple of reminders across the board on dressing grooming for students. We are seeing young men's hair lengths being a little long. Please just 
that's an easy one where you can just notify the front office and then they will notify administration. If you're, if you're consistently seeing young men whose hair is covering their shirt collar, is covering their ears, or is descending to or below their eyebrows. Those are kind of our three primary um, uh, benchmarks, um, but just, just let them know. Another one, we have a lot of young men who are really excited about being able to grow facial hair. And they want the world to know that I can grow facial hair. So congratulate them. Let them know you're so proud that they can grow facial hair. And then um, let them know that one of the amazing, wonderful things about maturing and getting to that point is that you get to shave more frequently, possibly even daily. So um, that's another one where if you don't want to have that conversation, again, let administration know, and we are happy to have that conversation. As I discussed earlier at an earlier in-service meeting, there are times and seasons when it is not opportune for you to uphold a standard. This is why we have people instead of robots and computers uh, involved in much of this. But if it is an inopportune moment to uphold a standard, that does not mean that we just walk away from the standard. Rather, we delay the point of reminding or we invite someone else, engage someone else to do it for us so that we can still pursue the kind of relationship we're wanting to and needing to with that given student. Hoodies, sweatshirts, jackets, uh, we seem to have quite a few of those this year. Is it, is it more than normal? It feels like more than normal to me. No, it's about the same. About the same. Which is ironic because we've expanded the number of options of permissible uh, articles in that in that respect okay adam this one is for you intent to return is due today so if you did not submit that please do so you're going to hunt for an email from adam that he sent on the 13th of this month it is entitled intent to return form 2022-2023 school year if you just type in intent to return, I'm sure it'll be the first one that comes up. But from Adam on the 13th, again, we're not expecting you to have concluded, which is why there are three options rather than two. Yes, I'm returning. No, I'm not returning. Or I don't know yet. And if you don't know yet, you could, you could choose to let us know kind of um, uh, what kind of considerations are still up in the air and why in the in the comment field. But please... Please complete that today. Jeff, yours is the next slide if you want to come and grab the microphone. All right, thank you for the time. I'll try to make it quick. Um, <clears throat> so the Constitution and Civility Center were the ones um, who brought you the, the monthly debates. Um, Grant, just so you know, what's that? Oh, <laughs> um, Grant is the executive director of the Constitution Civility Center, and then David Hancock and I and Adam Brewer are the co-directors. And the second kind of big rollout we're doing is the Constitution B, and I wanted to explain it just a little bit. It's not just a contest, it's a full course followed by a contest based on what you learn. And what you learn, what you're taught is the five clauses everyone should know, the first, the five most important clauses. The Supremacy Clause, the General Welfare Clause, the Treaty Law Clause, the Interstate Commerce Clause, and the Necessary and Proper Clause. There are four age categories, and each has prize money. Hi, and so I'm going to be sending out a flyer for you guys to hand out to your individual students within this week, hopefully. But the, the prizes are meant to incentivize kids to get excited. The first thing is high schoolers. Uh, first place gets $1,000. Second place gets $500, and third place gets $100. Middle school, $750 for first place, $150 for second place, and $75 for third place. And then elementary school, $250. $125 and $50. That's, that's three age groups, right? High school, middle school, and, and uh, elementary. And the fourth one we just added, we're going to do an adult Constitution B as well. And that won't be as much money. It's going to be more like we're still in the middle of deciding what, but we think we're going to end up with probably uh, four date night gift cards or two date, date night gift cards or one and a couple books as well for winners in that. So here's how it works. <clears throat> the basic structure is there are six 20-minute videos, and each one of those videos is followed by a quiz. And at the end is the final comprehensive Constitution B. And it's, all it is is all the same quiz questions in one final B. So you already know what all the questions are. 
just have to study for it and be ready. Those are all done online and done at home at your own pace, except for the Constitution B, the final exam of the course, has to be done by April 1st. And then whoever, like we haven't decided yet, maybe like the top 10 winners of the Constitution B at that point will advance to a live event to be held here most likely on April 22nd. That's the night before the AHS Worldwide event where they bring in Brad Wilcox and have a whole bunch of people come in from out of town and have a big conference. So we're going to do it that, that same evening. Uh, the cool thing about this too is that the six videos that you watch, they're all the same videos no matter what age you are. So it's really a cool opportunity. It's built in a way that's very family, uh, family friendly. You can all watch the videos together and then you can all compete in your own different uh, quizzes or bees on your own, but you can actually watch those videos together as a family. So that's the idea. Are there any questions about how it works? All right, uh, so you just go to right here, constitutionandcivility.org. That's the Constitution and Civility Center uh, website. And uh, I, like I said, I'll be handing out a, a, probably a, whatever, quarter, quarter page size glossy uh, color flyer, in, hopefully in this, this week here, to all of you. So you're all invited. You're all adults. You're all invited to do it. Um, a lot of you are parents of kids at the school, so it's a double incentive. You could get a lot of money and head off to Hawaii or whatever, but um, we'd love to have you participate. Any questions, you can direct them towards me or Adam or David, and we're happy to, to announce it. So thanks. Thanks. For those of you who are new this year, um, we announced the uh, creation of the Constitution and Civility Center last May when President Oaks came and served as our commencement speaker. And Grant announced it uh, and, and referenced an earlier call that President Oaks made in one of his uh, recent addresses where he'd, he's been talking a lot about law, civility, and the U.S. Constitution. He called for us to do a better job, us collectively as a society um, and as a church membership, to do a better job of understanding and teaching the Constitution. So uh, he was very pleased uh, when we referenced that call and then also announced uh, our creation of this center in response to that call. So Adam and Jeff and David, thank you so much for all of your good work to really start this off in a very polished and professional way. I've also been asking Dan and Jay Clark to do some work on building out a, a very professional looking set that we will be using to add even more polish to this series. Um, it's going to be something that I think we will be exporting quite a bit in the future. So please promote that with your students when you get that stack of flyers. Bathrooms, fun topic. Um, we've been having a few problems in restrooms and locker rooms. I'm going to just repeat a general request to try to be there um, to the extent that you can and to the extent that you're comfortable. It is a wonderful blessing for us to assume the same locations as these students to even go down into the basement of the arena and use the locker room when we need to use the restroom. This is more for the men than the women. I see a lot of women smirking and wondering, do I really need to? Um, but when we, when we send the signal that anyone, any adult could walk in at any moment, we, uh, we get a little bit better behavior. So please, uh, please try to be in the same spaces um, if you can. I want to I want to just say thank you so far. This, the, these last couple of months have been kind of turbulent. I've sent some whiplash throughout the community when it comes to COVID. Um, but I'm very grateful that uh, our tone, for the most part, has been incredibly positive. Um, we've done well this year. As I read through the parent surveys, and I'm not done with those yet. We'll get to those in a minute. Um, there are far fewer comments about COVID and our handling of it than I had anticipated. Uh, responses to my emails have been overwhelmingly positive both times, both school-wide emails that I sent. And a lot of that has to do with this group. This group is a tone setter. This group is a sounding board for many people in the community. They come to you. They know you. You're a trusted source. You're someone with whom individual parents and students have a close relationship. 
So I just want to thank you for choosing a very charitable course. As we practice civility, beyond just studying the Constitution and thinking about governmental systems, as we practice civility, we must rise above the tendency to look at our philosophical counterpart and label them as either being stupid or evil. We must have a broader imagination than that. And I would submit to you that doing so is one of the more fundamental aspects to cultivating within ourselves the virtue of charity. Okay, Charnay, you get the uh, microphone next. And I'm looking at the number of packages here on the stage. Okay, good. I was about to say, we, we may have some discombobulation today because that's what happens when you have an in-service on a Monday following a, a weekend rather than on a Friday and on the heels of an all-parent meeting. But it looks like we got our numbers correct, so here you go. Okay, I'm going to use this one because I'm shorter. I'm going to need Suzanne to come on down. <laughs> this is hard. Suzanne has been with us for over 13 years and um, so even longer than I've been here. But today is her last day at American Heritage School. She's got some great adventures ahead of her with Dan, her husband, and she is an amazing wife, mom, supporter of him and um, the experiences that he's having. And, and so she's, she's heading off to those pastors to help him and to support him. And so we're going to miss Suzanne. So Suzanne just confirmed they might even be moving out of state to help with his, his um, medical needs that he has. So essentially, I guess, Suzanne is retiring from American Heritage School. <laughs> and um, so I've got some thoughts I want to share with you about Suzanne. And then Jane Davis, I asked her if she wouldn't mind also sharing some, sh some thoughts because I think it was three years that you worked with Jane in, um, as an aide. Okay. All right, and we all know Suzanne. She's an amazing woman. Um, heart of gold, salt of the earth, all of that. She is loyal, dependable. She notices details like you can't believe. Um, she loves all she meets, no matter who. And um, I mean, you just know, you, look, you come into Suzanne's presence and you feel her joyful heart and her soul, and bring, she brings light to all around her. Um, obviously, we're going to miss you, Suzanne. You're an amazing woman. And Suzanne and I have a little bit of an extra connection because she's got some friends who went down to South Africa and uh, when my mom and dad were still in South Africa, and we used to have some good chats about the things that they were experiencing there as well. So that was fun. So from Jane Davis, she has written the following. Obviously, she can't be here today, so I'm reading it for her. Suzanne Gallup was my personal classroom aide for three years. She was meticulous and thorough in all record keeping, and she was dependable and responsible in completing all duties and assignments given. Her love for the children was very evident. She was always positive and kind to the children. Suzanne is a problem solver. She was always aware of individual needs. She was successful in tutoring children with special needs, organizing and, execu ex and executing instructional guided reading groups and preparing and presenting small presentations for literature. Suzanne's positive outlook and sunny smile make working with her a pleasure. When confronted with a challenge, Suzanne is always willing to give her best effort and try. Suzanne is loyal and tireless in her desire to help others. Suzanne is a team player, and she loved working with Suzanne. So as this is not a forever thing, we want you to come back. <laughs> we want you to come back and say hello, tell us how life is going and what, what adventures you're going on. We know that you've got amazing things ahead of you and the miracles that you've already seen in your life and in Dan's life will just be expanded and we're excited to hear all of that. So we want to give you this. It's 
just a little thank you for that. And we also have some other things that will be coming as well um, later on. So just want you to know how much we love you. So <laughs> let's give her a big round of applause. Oh, 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 sit down. <laughs> oh, you are too kind. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was reflecting on my, back on my connections and the people that I saw come and go and started out before when I lived here, um, lived in Cedar Hills, I should say, moved there in 1986, moved away in 1991 down to Austin, Texas for about 16 years, where I substitute taught there for about 14 years in elementary, then in middle school, and a little bit in high school. And my, my desire always was, oh, I wish I could share the gospel with these children, some of these children. They just needed it, but I couldn't say anything, and uh, much. <laughs> but... Um, but I, uh, before I left, I was homeschooling a little bit, and I homeschooled with Maxine Kertola and uh, Shirley Kaufman, who are connected with this school. Both of them, one of them became a principal early in the days, and and another a, a an assistant principal. And and met Ladon Jacob, uh, Liz, where did she go? Liz's mom, and uh, and her family. Uh, through that, and had I stayed, I would have, my children would have come to this school, and I would have been probably a teacher or something, but in the early days when I came, Loretta was teaching, and Sharon, and I can't remember her last name, was, was teaching, and I subbed for them and worked with them, and uh, Linda Coy, Linda Bingham Coy, uh, in fifth, fifth grade, and, uh, and then subbing for I loved subbing for, for Jared, for, for Mr. Cornell. That was great. Uh, subbed a bit and then worked in the front office. I uh, was over the ACTs, uh, setting that up for several years and ordering and all that. Worked with Chase when he first came and, and worked with uh, Stephanie Bigelow and, and Stephen um, in, uh, in doing um, spirit wear for many years also and uh, and then with uh, with my with my great friend Melanie in the, in the library I love her and I wanted to lift her burden and I just she does so much and when I was in Austin the, the library was the heart of the school because everybody passed through there and so important. Worked with Lynette and Shirley uh, and Melanie on uh, starting the Fountas and Pinnell testing, and we did it for all the teachers, and then we could see how valuable it was for every teacher to do it so you could know what your student, how, how it was, and, and it, was, it was fabulous. And then working with Jane, um, working with uh, Earl on his last day here, and, uh, and Ty Crossley, when you came, met you first when you came and your girls coming up from Arizona and uh, 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 let's see and and anyway just I, I just I've just had a lot of uh, and then when you came uh, Charnay and your family and uh, so many uh, I've, I've just appreciated and been built up and and loved this school and because I grew up in Connecticut I I loved going to the U.S. history and church history places. They were in my heart. And with Heidi, I know, uh, and, and some of the others of you, uh, and uh, I had been in the Hillcomora pageant in 1978 and got to go again in 2019. It happened to be the last year. And uh, Jane, actually, and her husband came out, and, and, and I got to see her there. And uh, uh, great to be with my husband. 
he, he is doing uh, better, but we are up for a kidney transplant, um, and we hope that that comes soon down at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Um, but I have loved working uh, in the library and with reading with my little Patriot book group and with those children. Um, and uh, just so many, so many good, marvelous, wonderful people. And uh, of course, Maddie, when she came, I helped kind of get her her job, kind of. <laughs> and uh, that was awesome. So, um, so grateful and and uh, know that that the the purposes and 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 the planting of the gospel that how you can because when I homeschooled I loved bringing the gospel into everything and I love that we can do that here and really plant in the hearts of the children and their minds the the this great country and and this great gospel because uh, they're they they go together so hand in hand um, grateful, grateful for all of you because you've touched my lives and I'm grateful to have served you and served with you. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you Suzanne. Like I said, the door's always open. Come on back and say hello. We want to see how your adventures are going. And then just a little bit of news. Um, Lynette Carver is not going to be returning for the remainder of this year. She's having some health concerns with her heart, and she just needs to be home. So if you don't see her in the building, that's why she she will be. Um, we'll see her later, though. Okay, Chase. Thank you so much, Sharnay, for uh, for putting such a wonderful tribute together, and thank you, Suzanne, for thirteen and a half years of lifting in so many areas and in loving students. So I had so much fun with Adrian's pop quiz last time. I thought, let's uh, maybe not on quite as big of a scale, just three questions, but I thought that's kind of a fun little, maybe a new tradition. We'll see how it goes this time. Okay, this time we are, I'm diving into the, the arena of faculty dress and grooming. So. Uh, question number one, I'm engaging in an activity that is best done in more casual clothing. How should I dress for the day? A, since function and not just form is an important consideration, dress in the more casual outfit for the day. B, change clothing during the day so your attire matches each activity. C, cancel the planned activity and replace it with another that doesn't require different clothing. Or D, like those sneaky airline passengers that refuse to pay for a check bag, layer your outfits in a manner that allows you to quickly and easily remove one when your activity changes. What do you think it is? <laughs> the correct answer is B. Um, there's a lot of room for judgment here, though, and a lot of trust for the individual. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, but uh, that, that last triple period, last ellipsis, obviously given the various factors and scenarios involved, such as the number and frequency of different assignments throughout the day and the logistics of changing between classes and assignments, professional and personal judgment will need to be exercised by each employee in implementing this standard of changing your outfit during the day to match the activity you're doing. All right, gentlemen. Question number two, what guidelines exist for male faculty wishing to wear facial hair? A, men are not allowed to have facial hair unless they are in a play. B, men can have any facial hair they desire so long as they avoid soul patches, goatees, or sideburns extending onto the cheek. C, beards longer than six inches are permissible only if they are shampooed daily and are deemed by seven out of ten coworkers to show no signs of breakfast. And D, beard should be shorter than 0.5 inches and initiated during vacation or personal leave time. What do you think it is? The answer is D. The school encourages men to be clean shaven. However, facial hair, if worn, should be conservative in style, not longer than half, one half inch in length and neatly trimmed. Uh, Part of B was correct, which is this next sentence about soul patches, goatees, and sideburns. 
and then given that beards in various stages of early growth can appear patchy and unkempt, we encourage those who choose to wear facial hair to consider growing it to the desired length during vacation or personal leave time if possible. Um, it's really important that we not just use this as a reason to show up if we're in a hurry and we look like we just didn't shave for a day or two. That's particularly hard when we're trying to uphold a similar standard for our young men. Uh, it begins to look a little inconsistent um, and from their perspective, perhaps even hypocritical. Um, so if you're going to have facial hair, wonderful, but please you know, start it over a weekend or over a break so that when you do return, it looks like you're actually trying to grow a beard and not just you know, didn't have time to shave that morning. Last, what? Little thing right there, just a little tuft right there. <laughs> okay, question three, and this is why we don't allow them. Thank you for, for answering the, uh, the question that I didn't answer and preempting all the various people who were gonna come up and ask me why not? So, okay. Number three, for ladies, which slack is conducive with the women's dress standard? <laughs> so... Now for the correct answer. Now for the correct answer, which I am not going to give you. I've, I've made some mistakes in my life, but uh, um, I'm not going to make another one right now. So I'm going to invite Liz and Charnay to help answer this question. The answer is what? Charnay is saying the answer is C. Okay. So, so the quick tip, the quick tip, and I have this on authority from a former member of the uniform committee. Uh, two quick tips: the cut needs to be straight-legged, and the material is the other important attribute: polyester, wool, or a blended fabric, which will hang differently than cotton and is better at avoiding wrinkles than cotton. So, I'm wearing cotton pants today. Okay, so khakis, chinos. Um, same goes for men, too, by the way. Okay, that's the end of our pop quiz and the end of our, our political conversations. Um, okay, last announcement, and I need, to, I need to preface this by saying that what I'm about to share with you is top secret information. It stays in this room. Um, it will be public. You will know that it's public when you see it on Patriot News as a little snippet that we're going to sneak in there. We have two really beloved traditions at the end of the year where we allow faculty to compete against students. We have the kickball game for eighth graders and we have the basketball game for those who are on the varsity basketball team. And I've been thinking for a while, hmm, I really want us to have something that is available to all, you know, more students um, and, you know, not specific to a specific sport or a specific team or a specific grade level. And so I've been scheming with Brian Smith, our coach of athletic conditioning, and we are going to, on field day, roll out the Marine Corps physical fitness test for all faculty and all high school students who wish to, wish to join. What is that test? It has three events. Pull-ups, or for females, you can do a flexed arm hang, a plank, and a three-mile run. No, this is serious. <laughs> for those of you who are wondering, should I, should I participate? The answer is please do. Here, here is the uh, here is the scoring chart. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of obviously detail between the minimum and the maximum, but I'm just letting you know minimum and maximum right now for females. Minimum on the pull-up requirement is actually a 15-second flexed arm hang. 
the time ends when you either let go of the bar or your elbows straighten out. But 15 seconds there. Um, plank, a minute 10. Three mile run, 31 minutes for women. For men, four pull ups. Again, a 110 plank, one minute, 10 second plank, and 28 minutes on the three mile run. Okay? We will be competing against the students. We will have various awards for individual best score and we will have a team component. We haven't finalized exactly how we're gonna do that, but we're thinking maybe something along the lines of the ways that you do scoring for cross country teams where it's top five here against top five there and then we just see. But we really want the students to know that experience and wisdom count for something and, 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 and can propel a team forward. So that's our advantage. I'm also giving you another advantage of letting you know sooner than they get to know. So you can begin eating your Wheaties and consuming your spinach and otherwise, you know, calling upon your inner Rocky Balboa. So please come and talk to me if you want to join or if you have questions. It looks like we've got a couple quick questions here. Ty? The answer is yes. There actually are age categories, and what I've put in front of you is 17 to 26. I think it's the one that would it, it would be it would be applicable to uh, it'd be applicable to our students. So <laughs> something like that. <laughs> something like that. So I will, be, I will be recruiting some of you. For example, I understand that there is a high school teacher who comes downstairs regularly to do pull-ups when he's not wearing a cheese hat. Um, I also understand that there's a kindergarten teacher who is more than happy to put her nose on the line, literally, when it comes to physical challenges and competitions. So... Um, All right, let's jump into parent surveys, and we're going to go through this a little quicker than I had anticipated because we're getting close to 9 o'clock, and we need to have a stretch break, and we have some other things planned for the next hour. Um, yes, please do. Those are words of a transformational teacher. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> there's only one bed in that room. Oh, there's two now. But we still only have one wheelchair, right? One wheelchair, one bed. OK, we're having too much fun with this. This is serious, OK? I really want you to. I will be doing it, yes. I would never ask you to do something I wasn't willing to do myself. So. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. We are not discontinuing those. Those are beloved traditions. All right, um, let's run through a deeper dive on um, surveys quickly. Actually, I think we may spend a little bit more time on this. I think I may abbreviate one of the other sections. Um, I want you to see more of this, not less of this. Um, so you can see here just uh, the, uh, some demographic information about those who responded, uh, where they have children, you can see we're pretty evenly split across our four grade level uh, groupings. Um, uh, 
we're doing well. You're doing well. Can you even read that up there at the top? Or is the, I see one or two heads nodding. Okay. The, uh, the words are quite small. I just copied and pasted this right out of the survey tool. If, it's, if you see blue colors, though, that's me creating a charter graph that, that further dissects this. Um, for example, that second to the bottom one, my child has a strong orientation toward personal improvement because of AHS. We had a little less strong excitement or agreement there. So I wanted to open that up and just see if there were differences by grade level. Um, or not. Um, and we'll do that a couple of times here. Now the one that I want to dive into here is um, the very first one, spiritual. My child regularly references AHS curriculum during family gospel discussions. Okay. Uh, does that change by grade level? And the answer is no. We're, we're, we're pretty consistent at, um, at giving our students meaningful things to bring to the dinner table, and our parents are noticing that. School's impact on my family life. The second one, I have developed meaningful friendships in the parent community. That one had the least strong agreement. And of course, uh, what we would expect, those who are newest have had the least amount of time to volunteer, come to events, sit on sidelines, and make friends. And as they are here longer, they begin to relish in the community that is American heritage. OK. Um, this was a new question. How do you feel about the four standards? Every single one of them is predominantly in that just right column. Now, dress and grooming has the most deviation. The others are like 97%. And we might say, well, dress and grooming looks weak. I would invite all of us to actually consider it not relative, but in absolute terms. If that were a political race, it would be deemed a landslide. 75% are saying it's just right. So let's dive into that one, though. Huh. That's not what I was expecting. Our strongest fervor in terms of parents on dress and grooming is actually in the high school. Not to a statistically significant extent, but that's where parents feel the strongest. We'll ask the students in a couple weeks. But the parents like that standard. OK. This one, um, this is probably one of my favorite questions this time. This is new. I explained, I, I dove into this one a little bit in the parent meeting. But in the past, we have asked parents two free response questions. Why did you come here? And why do you stay? And it took a long time to read through all of those free response paragraphs, but they were incredibly rich with, with uh, feeling and meaning. And over time, we saw 10 themes really uh, surface as we looked across the, the aggregation of parent response responses. And this year, we built the question differently. Rather than having these two free response fields, we just took those 10 themes and we put them in front of the parents and said, rank these. Rank these in order of importance for us. Now, what I pointed out to the parents last Thursday night was two groupings here, the top five and the bottom five. What do we see common across the bottom five, those that were ranked six through 10? Academic rigor, small class sizes, course variety, high quality campus, extracurricular pro programs. These, I would submit, are things that we would typically see as typical measures 
or assessments of educational institutions. If we were to compare across 100 different schools, we might use these as our measuring sticks. Now contrast that with the top five. Faith-infused curriculum, number one. Loving teachers, number two. Character-based education, standards, safe community. These, I would submit, are our differentiating factors. These are our mission priorities. These are what makes us different. And our parents are saying to us, we really like those things that make you different. That's what's most important to us. Please keep the main thing the main thing. Homework. Homework is looking good. Um, we've had periods in the past where we've gotten low marks on homework, but uh, we have, for the last few years, been consistently towards the left side of this spectrum. Now, unlike some of the mission and culture questions that we've had where we are heavily to the left, I don't think we will ever get um, completely to the left on this one because no matter where we draw that homework line, there will always be those for whom the rigor is too, too much and those for whom it's too little. So we're never going to get to an A plus on this when we aggregate across all parents. A B minus might be as good as we can get and that's, that's okay. Uh, ranking the, uh, the academic programs. I mentioned in the parent meeting that we are doing some things to address our, our technology curriculum. Um, we are specifically looking very, very earnestly and seriously at hiring an, a director of education technology starting this fall. I'm going to be in meetings this week uh, with our network technology director to start talking about that, carving that out, getting some consultation from him, and then we should see a, uh, a job posting follow shortly. One of the results of that, well, there's, there should be a couple of results from that. Uh, one is that uh, I expect that we will be offering AP computer science consistently year after year. Uh, we will not have a revolving door at that position, but we will have uh, some tenure there. Another is that we will have an administrator who thinks deeply about how to use technology as a classroom tool. Up to this point, our technology approach has been largely from a network perspective. Our technicians are network technicians. They are not education experts. They know that. We know that. We've tried to get them to do both to some extent. Um, and this is just an area where we want to do a little bit better. Um, on the world languages front, we've made a lot of improvement there. Um, as I've read through the comments, though, and I've talked to Liz about this too, and she agrees. One of the problems we have is we have some lagging effects here where we've made substantive changes, we've, we've done some new messaging, but some of the sentiment remains from the past. In particular, there is um, a lot of people who are, in, who are marking it in that poor category are saying things like, I really want Mandarin, or this ought to be immersive and at least five days a week, and we should have you know, immersion programs. Um, so there's an expectation gap um, in the part of some of our parents, but those who do not have an expectation gap, those are the ones that are landing in the excellent and in the good column. And so this we think is, is something that uh, uh, to some extent just needs to be addressed with a little bit more communication from administration to parents. Yes. Do you want to articulate that? Um, I'm going to give you the, the microphone on that, actually. I read it long ago in an email, but it was before I was a member of the curriculum committee, and so I don't want to misspeak. It's been a while since we wrote this, so I'll do my best to recollect how we worded it. Uh, our goal at American Heritage with World Languages is not the outcome of students who can speak that language fluently. We, have, we do want students to develop a love for the countries and the language itself and to understand that culture better. Uh, for those who desire to serve missions, we want them to have excitement around that opportunity. 
but we instruct our world language teachers not to give a lot of homework. In fact, they give very little homework. They also have very little class time. We actually have significantly less class time here in our world languages than at a typical public school. That is intentional. We don't function them as a four day a week classes like we do our English and our science and our history. We do them as two day a week classes um, because the philosophy behind that is students learn languages very quickly when they're immersed in that situation. It's much more painful and difficult to learn it when you're not immersed. And um, so we're exposing them, we're, we're touching on it, we're helping to build excitement around it, but we're not actually trying to make them fluent in that language as a student at American Heritage. Thank you, Liz. And that's important for all of us to, to understand again because we become sounding boards for people. Each one of you, for some student, for some parent, is the, is the person in this institution with whom they have the closest relationship. And they will come and ask questions and make comments. And so as you, as you hear things like that, it's, it's helpful if you recollect and, and can reiterate and articulate some of these talking points. Okay, arts programs. Don't pay so much attention to the color on these ones because so much of the relative darkness is in that far right column, no basis for opinion. But if you just focus on numbers, you see that our performing arts programs, people are really enjoying quite a bit. Same thing with our athletic programs. And then just overall sentiment, how are they feeling? Uh, again, you're doing a wonderful job. The vast majority, 77%, are saying, I feel extremely grateful and fortunate to be here. Again, if this were a political campaign, that would be a landslide. In fact, uh, people would think it was a banana republic with us rigging the vote. Um, that's how good you're doing. Um, 94% are, are saying, I'm at the very least mostly pleased. Only 6% are, are signaling any kind of a current sentiment of concern. On the next one, how satisfied are you on a scale of 1 to 10? 9 out of 10. 10 being highly satisfied. And then the third question on sentiment, how likely are you to refer a friend or family member to the school for next school year? 60% said, I already have. I already done it. Um, and of course, what better compliment can they give us than to recommend their friends and families to us? Okay. Um, there's a lot of free response in this survey, and I still haven't read it all yet. We haven't digested it all yet. It'll take us weeks to do that, and we will do that. I do want to just hit on a couple of points, though, um, just briefly. Again, for the sake of giving you some, some explanation, if you have any of these questions, or to give you some explanation in the event that you become a sounding board for someone else. So football, this was one of the more common suggestions. Uh, I probably saw it about 10 times. And again, I haven't even been through everything yet. Um, but football, big question. Uh, football teams generally have about 60 people. And a football program generally starts in middle school and goes all the way up to high school. And you have one team per grade. And if we just look at high school as an example right here, we'll even ignore middle school, but just look at high school. If we had one team per grade, that's four times 60, which gets us to 240. And in our high school, we have 315 people. Not boys, we have 315 people. Okay, next. Um, emotional resiliency course in high school is a required class. Liz will be teaching that one next year. So that one is coming. We call it the science of happiness. And it's part of a new suite of courses that we are introducing next year, uh, six in total, where we focus on some of the patterns and habits of discipleship. Okay, These are things like principles of leadership, financial literacy, civics and civility, science of happiness, lifelong wellness, and family science, each being a term in length and each being uh, graduation requirement. Uh, finally, mentoring of elementary children by high schoolers. I wanted to put this one up here and give you high school teachers a challenge or an invitation. Um, as soon as one of you wants to concoct a course where you do exactly this, I will be so excited. 
Um, I think one of the greatest skills that we could ever give our graduates is that of being an effective teacher and an effective mentor. Whether they hold that title professionally or not, they will be doing it throughout their lives. When they are missionaries, when they are senior companions, when they are working in the church, serving in the church, when they are working with colleagues in the work world, when they are parents, first and foremost, when they are parents. And so if somebody wanted to concoct a course where they really sought to relay the skills of mentoring and coaching and teaching well, I would be excited. So there you go. Yes. Excellent. That's, that's true. We, do, we already have a TA program there. The math department has done some wonderful things with carving out some space for some of our, our more advanced and, and uh, uh, knowledgeable high school math students to do tutoring. Uh, that's a wonderful experience for them. Is there a comment over here? Wonderful, wonderful, and that's great. We don't need to make, it, this doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be formal. It can be collaborative between teachers, and that's great too. Wonderful. Okay, um, subtractions. Public school classes are now smaller than AHS classes. Some of our children's classes take place in an auditorium, yet on the website it claims class sizes are 21. That was true five years ago. It's actually still true today. Um, uh, we have plenty of classes that are very, very small. Um, they just don't get seen as often. They don't, you know, not as many people are in them, so they're not being talked about as much. But when you take, when you run a Veracross query and you look at all classes, all classes, and you average out the typical class size top to bottom, we are at 21. Okay, um, improvements. One of the biggest differences between AHS and other options are the teachers. They are passionate and they are top quality. They are what make the educational experience at AHS the best. Protect your teachers. I've seen far too many teachers stretched way too thin this year. What has changed? Now, I had actually planned to, to pause here and have sort of an open forum discussion on this because I wanted to hear it from you. It is 9.15 and I need to move quickly, but I'm going to just invite you. If you feel passionately about an answer to that question, come and visit with me. I want to hear your answer. I really, really want to hear your answer. Um, I think that there are some things that we've done to stretch people generally during the last two years. Some of it's unavoidable just because of the nature of COVID and remaining open and dealing with an extra burden. But that, that may be applied too broadly and maybe we are allowing ourselves to be blinded to other substantive issues just by coloring all of it as COVID. And so maybe we as an administration are just missing some things. So if you feel um, like you have a good answer to this question that you want to share with me, please do so. Last one, and then we are going to take our stretch break um, after this point. Um, I actually don't want to see any programs added in the future. It seems like AHS is trying to be on par with public schools. Focus on what you do best, your mission. Don't try to offer so many different sports, extracurricular classes, clubs, and activities. In my opinion, as you've grown, you've strayed. You've strayed from the foundational core, and it's concerning. This is a sentiment that I have seen and heard many times through the years. You know, this is just one of several, but I'll hold it up there as being representative. Um, I want to address this, this idea that as we add a program or as we grow, we're straying from our mission. 
And I want to I want to invite all of us to pause for a second and reflect upon that mission in our heads. Where does that mission say we will teach geography? Where does that mission say we will teach biology? Where does that t mission say we can't do clubs, extracurricular classes, sports, and other activities? It doesn't. Um, if you wanted to get highly technical, you might be able to argue that our mission does carve out special consideration for history because of the third bullet point that we will help our children to develop an understanding, love, and appreciation for America and the Founding Fathers. Right? You might argue that that's, that's a reference to history. But if you were to take such a technical, textual, textual right, um, approach to that document, you would also have to apply it consistently and uniformly. You'd have to conclude that athletics is also in there because we reference body not once but twice the development of the body, the governing of the body. Not once, but twice. Say it again. Proprioception. So um, I, for one, am arguing that as we have grown and as we have expanded our programs, we are actually becoming not less but more aligned with our mission mandates. I now want to show you one of my favorite set of numbers and statistics. We have a culture of participation. And this is something that I'm going to keep measuring year after year after year. I'm looking at the junior class. There are lots of ways to measure well-roundedness and participation. Um, and I admit that my chosen measure is not comprehensive. There are people who are taking piano lessons and they're doing uh, gymnastics courses after school and things that don't involve us and, and, and that's good and worthwhile too. But what I've chosen for my personal measurements is to look at the junior class where they're old enough to be involved in some of these things but not so far along that they say, oh, colleges aren't looking at my senior year anyway, so I'm just going to take it easy. But these three measures are AP course enrollment, performing arts participation, and athletics participation. And you see there that out of 70 juniors in our high school, 59% are enrolled in an AP class. 49%, basically half in performing arts, and then also half in athletics. That's phenomenal. 100 students auditioned for the play. I had a conversation with uh, the former three-decade-long um, drama director of Mountain View High School, and I shared this with him. And he said, well, I used to have 200 show up for mine, but I had like 2,500 students, though. You have 315 high school students? Wow. That's a third. 84% of our juniors are doing at least one of these A categories academics, arts, athletics, at, an, at a level of excellence. 84% are involved in at least one, 33% in at least two, and one in five are doing all three. And the year isn't finished yet. We educate the whole child here. We educate the whole child. And in this business of, of character education, we, um, we're going to use every tool in our toolbox. Our mission isn't geography or grammar or biology or soccer. Those are not foundational items. They are tools. They are tools, and tools changed. But different tools do different things, and we will, as we sculpt character, we will use every tool to have to take a comprehensive approach to sculpting to character. I like to say, as I categorize our tools into just these three categories, I like to say that the arts are particularly well calibrated at enticing culture. Academics and athletics can too, but arts are particularly potent. When I was a high school student singing in choir, I felt the spirit regularly. It was almost guaranteed. If the, if the text was sacred, I was going to feel 
my father teaching me and reaching out to me and buoying me up and saying to me, you're doing a good thing. You're sharing an excellent message with this audience. Last night I was on a Zoom call for um, the Nauvoo Pageant Ensemble, which all my family gets to be a part of this year. And we heard testimonials from missionaries who have been doing this year after year, as well as other cast members who are returning cast members. And they basically just said, our experience was transformational. They didn't use that word, but that's what I heard. As they were there on the stage, sharing their testimony through drama, they, they learned and they grew and they developed and they felt powerful feelings. Arts entice character amazingly well. Now the classroom, academics. Academics are particularly potent at informing a character. It's in the classroom that we study great people. We dissect their, their character, their life missions. We borrow best practices from them. We develop frameworks. And as we, as we try to invite our students to be excellent in their character, we cannot ignore the, the informing phase of that. We can't have people who are just doing the after-school fun stuff. We need them to be good students too. And finally, athletics. I would submit to you that athletics is particularly potent at testing character. Will I hold my temper? Will I keep a smile on my face after I've been treated unfairly? Will I win graciously and lose graciously? Arts entice, academics inform, and athletics test character. And we want to use all of them because our goal is not to create great geography experts, great soccer players, or great biologists. Our ambition goes much, much further than that. We want men and women of great character who have been formed from a multitude of angles. All right. We're going to go ahead and take a stretch break for about five minutes. Stand up. Use the restroom. Get a drink of water.
I learned at last uh, in service that I'm not supposed to say okay at this point. But yeah, let's go ahead and give a standing ovation for all those people who are outside. And while we're waiting for them to come back in and sit down, let me just also mention one more thought on our culture of participation. Some, some might, might react to what I just said, and they might say, OK, yeah, athletics and performing arts are intellectually expansive in ways that are unique from academics. But there are plenty of organizations out there after school that provide these opportunities. So why, why do we have to do that, too? Why, why should we even be in that space? Is it really part of our, um, our scope? Should it be part of our scope? And my response to that is, yes, there are other pursuits out there that do those things, but do they do it the way we do them? Do we have, do we have, do we have choral organizations that are focused on the Savior and produce CDs called The Master out there? Those are hard to find. Do we, have, do we have basketball teams whose coaches liken the work ethic on the court to the observance of this for strength of youth standards and kneel in prayer at the end of practices? Those are very rare. Uh, some of you later today are going to be talking a little bit about um, scheduling constraints between programs and sometimes it's between academics and arts and athletics I would invite you to do one thing as you approach those conversations uh, I know what it's like as a teacher to show up and have half my class gone they're at a Seder service or they're at BYU's uh, sports medicine department uh, touring or they're hiking Timpanogos or they're something uh, you know I know what that's like I've been there before where I've prepared and I'm excited and it's you know it's part a of, of a part B that comes next week and it's really essential for me for my purposes to have that building block and now I feel like I've lost a day I know what that's like um, and I also know what it's like to have to reconcile to myself an explanation there as you approach these conversations later today or throughout the remainder of this semester with your colleagues and other departments and other subjects, please approach them from this perspective. Please assume that what they're doing is also important. Please assume that they too have put in a lot of effort, that they've planned something that will be meaningful, that yours isn't the only meaningful opportunity and that now it's been removed from the students. Uh, there's going to be some amount of uh, compromise that comes out of, out of all of this. Uh, everyone needs to compromise a little bit, but please have that as your starting point, that the other, the other person's program is important to them and important to their students as well. Okay, I had um, two more uh, items to talk about today. We're going to cut one in the interest of time and just focus on respect. We have... Notice the decline in respect in some of, some of the department meetings that follow this general session. We'll go a little bit deeper, and you'll, you'll jump into a little bit more of an applied, age-specific conversation about this. Here, I want to just set the stage a little bit for, uh, for that conversation. Um, I have also invited our, our friend, Brother Tolman, who is our seminary principal. I've invited him to take some time at the microphone during this segment. Brother Tolman has nearly three decades of experience teaching in CES. We all spend a lot of time swimming in this pool. We know the temperature of the water. We know the size of the pool. We know the depth of the pool in different areas, and we've become very used to it. Uh, Brother Tolman has a very unique perspective because he has been familiar with multiple other pools. He's recently... Uh, familiar with other pools, and he's even continuously uh, exposed to other pools by virtue of the fact that he uh, has collaborative 
um, experiences with, with other CES instructors at other schools. So I've invited him to come and talk to us a little bit about um, what he has observed in our pool and um, if, if there are some things that he can see uh, that we may not be seeing. And so I'm very grateful that he's agreed to do that for us today. Um, I just want to set up a few things before I time, turn the time over to him. So as we've approached this, this question, this concern about respect, and we see it top to bottom, kindergarten to 12th grade, um, it's in the lunchroom, it's at recess, it's in classrooms, it's in hallways, it's in bathrooms, as we've talked about before, it's in a lot of places. Why is it happening? Well, we've talked internally about three different theories. One is that COVID-19 protocols from the last two years have really stretched us thin. We did something amazing that I, I, I'm not aware of any other schools that were able to do it. We stayed open all day, all week, all year last year. And so far this year, we've done the same. And even this year, there are many schools who can't claim that. Even though we have a vaccine, we're further along in the learning curve of all of this. But that doesn't just happen. That's not easy to do. It's not easy to uh, keep yourself very compliant with the authorities who, who regulate us in certain respects, um, who, uh, who have some tug and pull on our business license. Um, and we've had to work hard and we've had to demonstrate that we are uh, very good citizens in that respect. And that's hard. It's hard to, to maintain all of the expectations that we already have, which were not a few. We're a school of many expectations, right? It's hard to maintain all of that and then adopt the, this new set of them. Something's got to give, right? So that's one. Uh, number two, this was a theory that was advanced to me first by Linda Strong, who is another wise and experienced person with also nearly three decades of experience here. Um, and I thought this theory was so fascinating. She just said, I can see it in my students. They lost a year of primary. They, they, they weren't being taught to sit still the same way they used to. No one, no one failed. It's, it was just a missing experience. When you add to that the fact that we've also gone from three hours to two hours, it's of, you know, that whatever practice we do have is of shorter duration. Um, so that's the younger children theory. The first one was, of course, a systemic theory. The next one is a younger children theory. And then the last one for older children, they've been at this school for a long time. And it's a small school, and they know one another so well. And they love each other. And they like to talk. And sometimes education gets in the way of what they like to do. Um, they really love each other. And we're glad that they love each other. We want, we want this to be a place that they want to come. That's, that's an end of a stick that we want to pick up. But there is an opposite end of that stick that we're seeing. And it's that they sometimes have a hard time uh, choosing to stop talking when it's time to stop talking and start listening. So um, I want to offer up one more theory here. This is one that I was thinking of this morning. This is from Alma chapter 9. Alma and Amulek have finished uh, powwowing, getting to know one another, planning, and now they are roaming the streets of Ammonihah and they are speaking, and they're being received in a certain manner. And here we hear Alma. As I began to preach unto them, the people of Ammonihah, they began to contend with me, saying, Who art thou? Suppose ye that we shall believe the testimony of one man? And they said also, We will not believe thy words if thou shouldst prophesy what this, that this great city should be destroyed in one day. And they further said, Who is God that sendeth no more authority than one man among this people? Now, um, before I allow your imaginations to apply this too far, uh, let me just clarify. I'm not suggesting that our students are beginning to question God's servants or God himself. Um, but there's a, there's, a, um, there's a pattern here or a, or a principle in play. And it's this idea that I will accept authority if it's the kind of authority that I will accept. Okay? 
um, that may sound like circular logic, let me change the term will. I shall accept authority if it's the kind of authority that I desire to accept. Okay. Um, we've seen this elsewhere in the scriptures. As recently as this last week or two in our Come Follow Me um, curriculum where we study Enoch and the way he was received. Um, people also asked him, now, now, who are you? Who exactly are you and where did you come from? Okay. Um, let me give you a very subtle, a very, very subtle um, example of this philosophy that I do see here. Again, very subtle, very small degree, but again, we don't, we don't wait for problems to be big around here to react to them, much like, much like what I shared last in-service meeting when we talked about the principle of cleaning the temple. Sometimes people show up, they, they spend three hours in the center, and they say, why am I cleaning this? I don't even see dust. That's the point. We don't want there to be dust that needs to be cleaned, so we clean it so that there never is dust. We want it to never look like it needs to be cleaned. Likewise here, we may look at significant problems like this, and we, you know, we could easily say, oh, well, that, that's not happening here. We don't need to apply that. But we don't even want there to be dust. So we're going to tease out a principle, and we're going to apply it here, and we're going to address, we're going to address things when they are budding. So um, this, is, this, is, um, this is a subtle application of this principle that I've seen. I've heard it from students. Um, I've heard it from parents, and I've read it from parents, even in the, um, even in the uh, parent surveys as I've been reviewing that data. And here's what it is. You're not the church. Why are you imposing this standard on me? You're not the church. Who art thou? Right? Who art thou? You're not the church. The church can expect me to dress a certain way, to behave a certain way, to speak a certain way, because that's God's organization. But you're not the church, so you can't expect those th same things of me. You can't set those standards for me. You're not the church. You're not the prophet. Well, there's, we could have an hour talking about that. But before I turn the time over to Brother Tolman, let me just offer up a few quick tools. If you see that kind of philosophy creeping in, I want to just offer up a few quick tools. Okay? The first is this. I think we need to, I think we need to help people understand that our Heavenly Father doesn't expect us to only honor His authority. Rather, he does expect us to acknowledge the authority of other people, other entities, other organizations. Let's go through a couple of examples that establish this. The 12th article of faith. The 12th article of faith indicates that we are to be subject to other entities. The mandate throughout Scripture that we are to honor our parents. They're not the church. They're not the prophet. But we are told to honor our father and our mother. And then my favorite one that I think actually gives the, the widest breadth of application, I want you to go back in your mind's eye to your Temple Recommend interview. Are you honest in your dealings with your fellow man? Oh, what's implied by that? What's implied by that is that when I enter into transactions, be they financial, be they legal, be they social. When I enter into transactions and when I make agreements, I am choosing voluntarily to bind myself. And God expects me to have integrity in that interaction. I am not justified by saying, well, because my counterpart isn't God. Because my counterpart is not the church. Because my counterpart is not the prophet. I get to pick and choose in this moment as to whether or not I will follow through with their directives. 
that that just that doesn't work are you honest in your dealings with your fellow man do you enter into associations and then honor the expectation of those associations or do you enter into associations with the intent to thereafter pick and choose which of that association's expectations you will honor freedom of association in the constitution goes it's a two-way street I am free to associate, and the association is also free to associate with me. And when I choose to enter into an association, be it a homeowner's association, be it a church, be it a private faith-oriented school, those associations have every right and every prerogative to say, this is what we expect of our members. This is how we want them to behave. This is how we want them to talk. This is how we want them to act. This is how we want them to dress and groom because they are becoming one of us and we want them to reflect our values. We want them to be ambassadors to the world of who we are. I've never, you know, I, I really liked um, Jenny Burr's comment when she was, where is Jenny, where are you? Okay, Jenny, hi. <laughs> I really liked her story from our last in-service where she talked about that, that moment she had with her husband. Um, and he said to her, he said, you know, I've, I've never worked for an organization that didn't have expectations of its employees about their work environments because they had their own customers or guests that would come in and they wanted it to look consistent and clean and orderly and so on and so forth. Uh, that concept applies beyond just how we manage our office space. I've never worked for an organization that didn't care how I behaved, how I conducted myself, how I dressed, how I groomed, how I represented the organization to its customers, to its guests, to its, its collaborators. So we are not the church, that's right. But we can and we will, we can and we will continue to have high expectations and high standards because we are in the business of elevating. And you don't elevate people by no or low standards. So I share that with you just to suggest that I, I, I suggest that as a fourth theory. Again, I think we have some people who are choosing which authorities they will acknowledge because they are adopting this, this philosophy that is floating around in, in various forms and to various degrees that I, I do get to pick and choose when I want to acknowledge authority. And when I don't want to it, I'm going to ignore it, disrespect it, otherwise discount it. So thank you all. I'm going to turn the microphone over now to Brother Tolman. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I am Brother Tolman, and, and uh, I've taught here for several years. I've been teaching 28 years um, seminary. And this is such a rare and unique place as far as that goes, because in any other place, the seminary is across the street. You know, it's not in the actual school itself. So in, in all my time in the church, uh, in, in the church education system, this is the only place that I know of where we get to do seminary right here in your school. And uh, so we're very grateful for that opportunity. Okay. Um, awesome. Thank you. So I thought I'd introduce myself just real fast. It's a big screen. I love that. Um, this is my wife. My wife is Tristan Tolman, and we have five awesome kids, and they're all married now, and our greatest um, achievement is that they're all happily married and married in the temple, and that has come through lots of incredible teachers throughout the years at, at different schools, and uh, if you look on your left there, there's a young lady in a pink dress who some of you might recognize because she attended school here. And uh, she ended up marrying um, my youngest son. 
So we're very grateful for the impact that American Heritage has had specifically on our family. Um, my only claim to fame, and it's not by me, it's through my wife. If you've heard of a television show called Relative Race, uh, done through BYU, then my wife is the uh, genealogist, the lead genealogist for that show, and, and finds, helps, and researches the people that end up being on that television show. But anyway, yeah, so for 28 years, I've had the opportunity of, of teaching, and uh, I've spent the last 12 of those years specifically overseeing and teaching in private school seminaries. So um, they specifically call us the academy group, but many of the schools I oversee are not academies. And like this one, we're a, we're a private school. So I over oversee those from, uh, well, Highland and Alpine down through Provo. Um, and so, yeah, Chase asked me to teach, uh, you know, or just talk a little bit about some, some of the things that, are, that a, a broader vision might um, help us understand a little bit better. And I've, I'm going to basically hit on just three things. Um, he ended up talking about how sometimes, you know, there, sometimes we get students who, are, who say, I'm going to obey the things that I agree with obeying, etc. Because we are in a school, uh, most of the academies have that I oversee, well, maybe not most, but probably half, are um, church-oriented toward the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so that brings with it some unique um, opportunities and some challenges. Most parents, I believe, want to send their child to that kind of a school because of the values and teachings that are being taught there, right? And they'll even pay a significant amount of money for that to happen. One unique thing that can happen is that you have a, a student who's not doing well in life at another school, and at a public school, and then often come January, they they switch and get brought to one of our schools, which is religiously based or at least oriented. Um, in a sense, we could say in the mind of the parent, they're sending their child to reform school, okay? <laughs> we don't ever wanna be viewed as a reform school, but sometimes in the minds of parents, we are viewed as a reform school. And so that sometimes we get, and especially maybe mid-year, January, we get some students who might be more challenging as far as wanting to follow the rules, especially when they come from a public school to now a school where there is a dress code, a very strict honor code, and you know a uniform in particular. So those are attitudes that, that uh, we need to be watching for in this kind of a school that obviously um, come because of that challenge. And um, like anything else, it takes a while to develop the one-on-one -on -one kind of relationship with those students. And so that's a challenge for us is to try to develop that relationship and not, you know, to try to find the balance of how hard do I push until, you know, until I develop that relationship. A second thing I want to talk about is cell phones. Um, when you've taught as long as I have and some others, um, I have eight beautiful grandkids. Um, I'm 50, well, I'm turning 55 this year. And uh, I, I remember the invention of the cell phone and when, and, and when cell phones began to be cheap enough to actually purchase, an, an individual could buy a phone and, and then to watch over the years as they just became commonplace and students, parents would buy a phone for their students and all of this transition. And uh, yeah, if, if some of you are maybe of the same opinion that it's been one of the most incredible inventions and yet one of the most challenging things to ever be brought into the educational setting because of its ability to distract attention. 
And so I've lived through this phase where we've watched school after school go through and say, are, what are we going to do as far as cell phones in the classroom? And a lot of schools are very open with cell phones in the classroom, and, um, and, I, I, and maybe some are doing it successfully. But what I notice in the private schools is there is generally um, an attitude of what we have here, which I personally very much appreciate, which is to not allow them unless the teacher is um, doing an activity or some educational uh, thing that they want the school, they want the students to use them. Um, from a bigger perspective, uh, when I was at Leahona, where I was before here for eight years, they got a grant where they went all electronic one year. And it was supposed to be the big new thing, the coolest, grandest thing, and they got a lot of money. And they said, okay, this next year, no textbooks. Everything is electronic. Every student got an iPad. They asked us as the seminary teachers to go all electronic to allow the students to use electronics uh, in the classroom. We were three months in when they aborted. They just said, we can't do this anymore. And I mean, it was just so much distraction. So the next year, they aborted mid-year, and uh, the next year they went completely the reverse, completely back to no more electronics in the classroom, um, paper textbooks, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. At Mazer Seminary, um, this last year, they tried this, and they said, okay, we're going to cell phones. You can use your cell phone. You can have it out. We know that's where your gospel library is. The kids just can't mark on the gospel library like they can in a paper, you know, in paper scriptures. So our attitude has generally been, and because most missions, at least a lot of missions, don't allow you to use electronics, we want you to be marking paper scriptures. Otherwise, you could not have any marked scriptures to take with you on your mission. But anyway, a Mazer, they tried this last year of, of for just for the last half of the year, they said, let's try electronics in the classroom. And then at the end of it, they said, okay, we're going all the way back to paper only. So, and there may be stories where it's the reverse of that, but I'm just telling you what I see in the seminaries um, that are the private school seminaries here. So I very much appreciate our, um, uh, the, the policy that is here, and we try to stick very much to that. And of course, there are those who will still pull them out, and we are working with them on a continual basis to keep them put away and less invited to use them. Okay, um, I think the thing I want to talk the most about, I know we don't have much time, but is just the chattiness that has been pointed out. Um, so, and the level of respect as I've taught over the years has just, you just kind of watch it water down, water down, water down. COVID, of course, has not helped with that at all. But at this school in particular, um, and because it is one of the largest private schools that uh, in the area, you know, there are some we we just have the challenges that have been pointed out, and I'll I'll talk about it here. I wanted to just hit on this again. This is remarkable, the the amount of connectedness that the students at this school have with each other, and it is an amazing blessing, and it's also um, a big challenge. I asked, I surveyed my students the other day. I said, "How many of you have been with each other in this classroom? How many of you have been to school with each other for more than three years?" And over sixty percent of the hands went up. And so, in a seminary setting, we usually have bigger classes. Um, you know, when I saw that your classes are the average twenty-one, I was like, "Oh, that's amazing! I wish the seminary class could be that small because that would help <laughs> reduce some of the chattiness to get them separated and stuff." But this is what's happening. And it was also pointed out here, when you got 84% of students involved outside of just the classroom. And so they're friends with each other, going to school for years, and they're with each other outside. That is so amazing. So I posed this question to my students the other day, on Friday. 
friends at school, life-saving blessing, or learning barrier. And after they thought about it for a while, guess what they said? What's the answer? Both. Yeah, it's both. And they all need friends, and they all want friends, and um, they feel very, very connected here, which is a huge success story. Now, the problem that we deal with is that it can become a learning barrier. So I just wrote this up. One of the benefits of a private school is that students often develop strong friendships with many people over many years. This just doesn't happen as much in the public school setting. And uh, because kids are just, they're not with each other that much. So the problem is that students can focus too much on friendships and not enough on education. So going to school can become all about friends rather than the proper blend of friends and education. So our challenge is just to help them to, uh, to see the problem, to recognize it, to say we honor it. I mean, we love that we have this problem here. But we also need to help you come back across the line sometimes, okay? So in a private school, students often have so many friends that there's no seating chart that can solve the problem completely. Okay, who's experienced this? Okay, yeah. To quote one student, who you probably all can think of one right now, it won't matter where you put me, I will talk. And the farther away you move me, the louder I will talk. So that's a direct quote from one of my students this year. Yeah. This just doesn't happen as much in the public school setting because, you know, you, you, the kids just aren't as connected. And so you can say, all right, I got so-and-so talking to so-and-so and move them away. And here, I, they're just going to have friends everywhere. And so we need to do some other things and have some other things in our toolbox to help us to address this. One of them being those smaller class sizes. Um, so and that's an opportunity for you to visit with about it. what can we do knowing that this is a unique problem to our connectedness here at our school. What can we do to um, to raise the level of respect with this issue that we have. One of the things I talked to our students about, the one, my students on Friday, um, I just asked them this, you know, true or false, discipline is an act of love. And of course it is. And what is the root word in discipline? And it's disciple, and the Savior taught whom I love, I also chasten. So. I just talked to them about if, when, if or when adults discipline you, it's an act of love for both of you and for the other students who are trying to learn. And so if we invite you to go visit with Sister Acuna, and they were not used to hearing that phrase, Sister Acuna, so you must be noticed something else, right? <laughs> anyway, if, if, you're, if you're invited to go visit with her about the honor code or respect, then it's an act of love. Or if we call you out on something, it's an act of love. Right? We just want to increase the environment of respect. One of the things I, I talked to the students about was how at this school, because they're so connected, I've actually had students come to me and say, Brother Tolman, can you move me away from my friends in the seating chart? I love to be with them, but they distract me, and I can't listen as well. I've also had parents contact us and say, will you please move my child away? So we were just frank and honest with the students and said, there's really nowhere we can move you to solve this completely. But if we move you, sometimes it's because a parent is asking us to move you for the better of, for your benefit, or sometimes a student is asking us to move you. And I said, true or false, that would be a really awkward conversation to ask your friend if they asked to be moved away from you, you know? So you don't need to have that conversation with them, but just know that's happening sometimes, that as much as they want to be with you, they, they realize they will learn better in a different setting. So that's a strategy that we're using um, to try to help there. 
Okay, well, I'll end on this. We're out of time. There's this great picture of the Savior carrying a lamb on his shoulders. And um, I didn't know what that meant or why that was painted that way until my wife and I took a trip to Israel and our, our tour guide talked to us about shepherding. And he said, that lamb that's on the shoulder, he said, why is he up there? And it's because that lamb had run away. And the first time the lamb ran away, the shepherd put the crook around the neck and he brought it back. And the next time the lamb ran away, he did the same thing, and he put the crook, and he brought it back. And the third time the lamb ran away, he took its foreleg, and he snapped one of the small bones in the leg, which caused an extreme amount of pain. And then he bound it up, put it on his shoulders, and now he carries that lamb until the leg heals puts it close to his mother, but anytime they move, then he carries that lamb. And, um, and that's called tough love. And he said, unless there are consequences, eventual consequences, you know, if the dog has all bark and no bite, you know, or if we're all talking no action, then, then the lamb just continues to run. So there has to be a point where even pain or tough love is applied so that the message gets through. And so one of the um, phrases that I learned in Education Week when I was a young dad, and I've had to apply many, many times in my life, is a simple phrase, I love you enough to let you hate me for a while. And I hope it won't last. But I love you enough to let you hate me for a while. And um, if I could tell you how many times I'd heard my own children say, Mom, Dad, you're the meanest parents in the world. You know? But now those same children have successful lives and thank us and look back and say, I can't tell you how glad I am. You didn't let me do this or you told me no this and you gave consequences. And um, yeah, so it doesn't last and they recognize the true love and so I just testify to you that we can do that with our students and set limits and then actually enforce those limits so that they learn to not cross those boundaries. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Tolman. We've come to the end of our meeting. Um, Mrs. Hurst, would you give us a closing prayer? Uh, before she sh shares the or says the prayer, assistant principals, do we have any last minute announcements about changes to the agenda? Okay. Maddie. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this chance to come together with open hearts and minds to um, to ponder on how we can best serve these students. We pray that they'll bless us as we continue in our meetings to apply what we've been talking about this morning and bless us with individual revelation as to how to apply um, this knowledge. We're grateful that we get to work together and a common cause, and we pray that um, that will accept our offering. <laughs> we are grateful for our students and their families, and pray that that will bless them, and uh, bless those teachers who are not with us at this time, um, and especially those who are enduring health um, health problems, that they will be healed and comforted and feel of our love. We're grateful for all of those who are stepping in to help during these hard times and, and pray that thou will bless us all with continued strength and ability to fulfill our roles. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.